back in our Father's Word, book of Deuteronomy. That, it's the law repeated by Moses in such a way that a lay person can understand. You know, God's law is a beautiful thing. And when you, if you want to be blessed, you're going to follow it, basically. And in the last lecture, he said, if you run across somebody that tries to steer people away from the real word of God and the real way of worship and get them to idolize something like cars, a business, or, or maybe even an idol, okay, or make an idol out of a business. And anything you put between you and God becomes an idol. He said, don't, don't let somebody destroy the community and take away my blessings. Move them out. Get rid of them. But do it only if you can find two or more witnesses to the fact that they are evil. And never, never punish someone with the voice of one witness because it could be someone with just wanting vengeance against somebody. That's where we left it in the last lecture. Let's pick it up if we may, chapter 17, verse 7, and let's go with it, continuing that thought with that word of wisdom from our Father. The hands of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death. In other words, this kind of keeps them honest. And afterward, the hands of all the people, so, that, so thou shalt put the evil away from among you. When, you know, and destroying God's church is a terrible thing. And when people try to drive God as they do now, especially, let's take Christmas season. What season is it? Well, Christians worship Christmas. And everyone does their level best, it would seem, in certain systems to drive Christians away from the center of things. That's not going to happen. And so it is. It will never happen. You don't have to worry about it. Well, they have seemed to be pretty successful only for a little while. And, you know, on the next block, it's legal. So do it when, when it is legal. Verse 8. And don't be afraid to push sometimes. Verse 8. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, that's to say in your town or your place of judgment is what the gate was, <clears throat> then shalt thou arise and get thee up into a place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Who, who does the choosing here? Almighty God. Because priest of the Levitical priesthood, it's the equivalent of our Supreme Court. Okay, of this day. That's what these people were experts in understanding God's law. And if it was between family and family, neighbor and neighbor, and absolutely you could make no discernment spiritually between them, then you go to the head law firm, which was the head church, a church that God himself would uh, choose, verse 9, and thou shalt come unto the priest of the Levites. Not, not one of your local tribal priests, but you go down to the main, this, like I said, the Supreme Court, priest of the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. And, and that's as it is. You know, God's law is neither nay, it's either nay or yea. Now, in our present day, our courts have, through the traditions of men, allowed precedent to slip in. That is to say, laws are judged by the precedent of events that transpired before and decisions made by men, not God. That's the fallacy. In other words, through the law of precedent will allow you to slip away from the law of God. And when that happens, God's blessings will be removed from a nation, a people, or a judgment seat. Verse 10. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show thee. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee. In other words, 
they will hear both sides of the law. And, and so it is. Incidentally, this 10th verse is the middle verse in the book of Deuteronomy. So if you want to know, we're halfway through. This is the halfway mark in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, one of the main mistakes made in law is like um, sometimes I will liken it like to pin the tail on the donkey. If all you see is the tail, you can't make a judgment there. You've got to see the whole donkey. And so it is in judgment. You have to hear both sides. And after you hear both sides, then you need the history of both sides as God's law applies to the history and to the present time in hearing both sides. And then the decision is made and God's law is always pretty plain and pretty simple. But uh, with many people, when they show preference of people, will hear only one side and boom, they make their decision. So you're halfway, half-baked and half out of step. You'll never go anywhere that way and you're sure not going to have God's blessings. So even in your personal decisions, watch that. Always, you know, this is the way trouble starts is lack of communication. And when you have lack of communication, misunderstanding slips in. So you get nose to nose and you communicate. Therefore, it eliminates any misunderstanding and whatever the problem is, nip it in the bud. Take care of business. Uh, hearsay and nonsense can cause hard feelings that can last forever over nothing, absolutely nothing. If the two had communicated, by the time people begin to blood on blood, that is neighbor on neighbor, relative on relative, they all begin to pile on, yeah, I saw this and I saw that and I saw something else, pretty soon it's a hopeless task. But God's law is so final, not according to what who said or he said or she said, but by the law, by the book, the decision is made and God's law is always final. It gets it right. Verse 11, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand or to the left. Don't you deviate once whatso one, one wit whatsoever. Now, it, it's important that you absorb this because a lot of uh, ministers would say, well, I have the right to say you will do this, child. That's not what it said. It said a true priest, a true teacher of God's word, is going to teach you what God's sentence is and why it's so, so that the child understands what the sentence is. And therefore, in understanding the law of God, after they are taught, they can see the, um, the harm of their way and want to fix it themselves even. So lack of teaching can cause many problems if one sets themselves up as a lawyer or a, uh, a uh, judge and makes decisions bang, bang, and without any explanation, any clarity, whereby the person doesn't understand. Never allow confusion to reign. That, uh, God is not the author of confusion, but peace, peace of mind. And God's Word brought forth by a true lawyer of God's Word, that is to say somebody that knows the law, to know the law, you've got to know the difference between commandments, statutes, and judgments. Commandments are God's law that will never change. Statutes are rituals worked into the law that even Christ will fulfill many of them. And judgments can have a twofold meaning. It can be reward for those that serve God, or it can be punishment for those that don't. So. Uh, to, to know God's law is a wonderful thing. And a wise person 
will never on hearsay pass out a verdict without hearing, what did I say? Both sides, complete, and the history, and then as it applies to God's Word. So uh, there you have it. Always a true teacher will teach the law itself with explanation, and then the person is to follow it as God instructs. Do you know what this brings? It sets in motion something. If you've fallen short and you're out from under the grace of God and things have gone bad for you, when you listen to the judgment and when, when you repent to Almighty God, if you had any bad part in it, then His blessings begin to flow in your life and things begin to happen right. It's very difficult to live a peaceful life. It's impossible to live a peaceful life without God's love, quite frankly. Next verse, verse 12. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. If somebody doesn't listen to God's law, you're better off without them. That's what he's saying. Verse 13, And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. One that is presumptuous can get you in a lot of trouble to presume something is so-and-so without going to God's Word and checking it out is ignorance. Ignorance is not bliss. It's trouble. When you uh, <clears throat> have the real thing, God's Word, to guide your path, to be your guiding light, to bless you, to guide you and lead you. How precious it is. Verse 14, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, it's important to know that He gives us things. He owns all of it, but He gives us a title to it when you, you purchase it, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. Got to have some man to rule me. You know, when we had God all the time, and you know, ultimately in the next chapter, God will promise us a man of our own that he will rise up who will ultimately be king of kings and lord of lords, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. <clears throat> but man always wants somebody he can see as king or president, or chairman. 15, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among the, thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. You don't ever, the house of Israel never ever puts a king or a president over them that is not of the brotherhood of Israel. Or you're headed for trouble. Anytime you fall, break one of God's laws that is plain as this one, you're going to pay for it. You will probably have a lot of unemployment. You will have a lot of trouble and you will have um, nonsense even in the high offices. Why? Because God's blessings leave it. Verse 16, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, that's to say put you in bondage with debt and what have you, and to, end that he, to the end that he should multiply horses, that means war, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. In other words, when, when you have a leader, never let him gain personal gain. He is supposed to be in, uh, uh, on lookout for the people and not for himself. If you ever have a leader that uses the word I, me, more than any other entity, you got trouble. I this, I that, me this, me that, I this. You got a heap of hurt. God's supposed to look out for the people. 
17, and certainly not overtax. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. It's, verse 18, And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levites. In other words, he will get him a copy of God's word, God's law, and he will memorize it. He will learn it. If he intends to be a ruler over God's children, he will go by that book, not by the traditions of men that make void the word of God, and not by hearsay, and not by guess or mess, and certainly not his own whims and our desires, but God's law. End of story. I mean, it is that simple. And you know what happens if he doesn't? God won't bless it. And God's blessings would leave that nation that would choose to do such until ramifications are put in place and things are corrected. Verse 19, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. He will not leave the word of God, if he's a true leader, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes and to do them. Doesn't do any good just to know them, just to memorize them. You've got to be a doer of God's word if you want God's blessings. And God's blessings are what prosper you and what give you peace of mind in life. So who wouldn't want it? Okay. I don't know. I, you can kind of, you know, you might say, well, let's put that to the test. Well, you can do that. How many of your leaders in the past have invoked the name of God? How many of your leaders in the past have prayed? How many of your leaders in the past have asked God's blessings on America and gone by this word? Then look how during those administrations God blessed America. The proof's in the pudding. You don't even have to be the brightest bulb in the drawer to figure that one out. Verse 20 that his heart, that is to say that his old ego, okay, that his old ego be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment, to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. In other words, you either do it God's way or God's going to see you're out, period. That's what it amounts to. You let a man's ego, I, me, my, get in the way. Then um, God's going to act on it. And he's going to make corrections. Now, if we go on into chapter 18, we go into the ecclesiastical law. That is to say, the law of the church. The law of church leaders. And... Um, they fit and are very befitting. And if you want a successful church, you will follow these laws as they are written to ministers, reverends, priests, preachers, and so forth. Chapter 18, verse 1. The priest of the Levites and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance in Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. That is to say, it was, it was possible that a priest, well, how could a priest have an inheritance when they're not supposed to? They can have a house. And the, the priest could not have an allotment of land, though, in the very uh, gathering place of Israel. Why? Because God was their inheritance and God will always be their inheritance. It doesn't get any better than that. But he can also have movable or personal property. 
and, um, and he can sell that property, that house, and retain that, those monies, okay? Verse 2, Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance. There you have it written. As he hath said unto them, and, and so it is, and it's so beautiful to read, even in the millennium years, the thousand year reign of Christ, when the God's elect are reigning there with him, that um, uh, the Zadok, well, that that's the just, the upright, that's God's elect. They also have no inheritance, for God is their inheritance, meaning everywhere you step, it's yours because God owns it. But you never take advantage of that. God's God's elect never try to enrich themselves at, at the expense of Almighty God. Verse 3, And this shall be the priest due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest one shoulder, and the two cheeks and the maw, now, uh, maw is kind of foreign to us today. It means the stomach and its contents. Why? Because it's fat. That's where the fat usually is stored. And God said, the fat belongs to me. Don't you eat it. It'll make you sick. And the fat is burned in the fire of the altar. But the priests themselves were given a front leg and shoulder and... Um, and, and so it is that uh, that part would be for their own benefit and their pay as priest. Verse 4, the first fruit also of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shall thou give him. And, and uh, what, 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 ha, what, is, uh, what has replaced uh, this? As I told you, statutes are rituals. And Christ fulfilled many of those rituals, such as blood sacrifice, animal sacrifice. You can read it in Hebrews chapter 10. Christ became our sacrifice for one and all times. Therefore, that statute of blood sacrifice or of the shoulder or the maw was nailed to the cross. Well, what does God want us to sacrifice then? Your love. That's what He wants. Hebrews chapter, um, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I do not want your burnt animals. I want your love. And if you really want God's attention, and if you want Him to bless you, you will sacrificially give of that love to Him for all that He has done for you. So naturally, much of this that we're reading is now transferred to love, nailed to the cross, and so forth. Verse 4, the first fruit also, uh, we got that, didn't we? Verse 5, <clears throat> for the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes, that's to say Levites, to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. In other words, it is, it, it is an election, and so it is that that priesthood would be forever. And uh, God will always bless that priesthood in the house of Israel. The house of Israel was taken captive 200 years before the house of Judah. The house of Israel went over the Caucasus Mountains, and many of them called Caucasians after that, settling Europe, and many of them later migrating to Canada, the Americas, and so it is today. So don't ever think these laws do not apply to you. It's God's law. How long did it say he would be a minister? Forever and ever. And so it is. That is the duty of the Levitical priest. That's why I stated these laws in this chapter apply to the um, priesthood. And so it is. Verse 6. And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourneth, and come with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose. In, in other words, he is a newcomer, 
a, a minister bringing a word, and that word is from the Lord, and you will make him welcome because it is the Lord that chooses him and the place the Lord chooses, if it's the real thing. Verse 7, Then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. And, um, so, and so it is. What, what do ministers minister? Well, they better be ministering what? The Word of the Lord. If you've got a minister that does not minister the Word of the Lord, what have you got? What you've got is a ratchet jaw. And he's never, you know, he's never going to be pleasing to Almighty God. Evangelists are excused from this, those that draw people into the church. But I'm talking about a pastor. A pastor comes from the word pastor, good old country saying, where you feed animals. And a pastor is supposed to feed the sheep, and the sheep are the people. But feed them what? The Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby they can know and understand the history as it was before and what these events became. This chapter we're in is such an important chapter. It's one of the first, not first, but one of the strongest promises that God is going to send us a Messiah, a Savior. And you find it way back here in this 18th chapter of the great book of Deuteronomy. But so that you understand what a preacher is and what a preacher does, he preaches God's words, not man's traditions that make void the word of God. You, know, you don't have to be, again, I'll, I'll use it, the brightest bulb in the drawer to understand that. You go to church to learn God's word, not man's doings. Verse 8, They shall have like portions to eat, besides that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. That, that means, a, a, that, that's a kind of a foreign word to us today, but it simply means his own property. And he, he could have, you might say like he could not necessarily own the land, but he could own the house that was on it. And he could sell that house. And that was his money. Okay. He, he, he could gain that. And there was even a city that was a priest city near Jerusalem. And a deed is buried there in that city. We learned that in the book of Jeremiah. We'll find it someday. Verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, you didn't, you didn't just accidentally happen. God gave it to us. You know, many wonder about this great nation. God gave it to us. Thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. You'll stick to the teachings of God. 10. Thou shalt not be found, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, always divining something up, or an observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch. You, you don't put up with things like that. And you know, it is an amazing thing. You've got to be real careful in this generation in teaching your children. Because our high court has passed laws where we can hardly teach this word, especially not in schools, but they can teach about witches and enchanters and familiar spirits, and all these things that God is against, they're able to teach that. And then people would wonder, well, how have children gone so bad? Children have not gone bad. Men, responsibility of the elders has gone bad, whereby God's law has parted. And the judges, who caused it? The judges have left open the door of violation and contrary to the law of Almighty God. And, you know, many might say, well, how are we and should we know we should follow the law of God? Because it's common sense. 
It would seem that common sense is flowing the cup. That's an old country saying. Just flew off in the night. And where did it go? Well, certainly I'm glad that there are still many people in this country, especially country folk, that have common sense. And they're going to hang on to it. That's God's way. But people wonder how children gun each other down. Why? Because of divination, witches, and um, uh, games, dragons, dungeons. On and on it goes. Enchanters, verse 11, are a charmer. That's a medium. Talk to the dead. Or a consulter with familiar spirits that talks to the dead. Or a wizard. A wizard likes to use drugs to get on a high, so he can, a spiritual high. Okay. Or a necromancer. That that is to say, a, a play actor or one that um, that um, can throw his voice and make a dummy talk. Okay. It's. God's against those things. Why? Well, it's against common sense. Verse 12, to complete. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth draw, drive them out from before thee. And so it is. God finds many things that he abhors in today's world. See that you stick with God's Word and see that you find and study yourself to be approved in utilizing common sense and holding the framework of common sense to keep your family healthy, wealthy, and wise. You know, God always blesses those that serve Him. You may be poor in the beginning, but if you will allow God to bless you you will gain with what you need. And what you need is to have sufficient. That's rich. Okay. When, you're, when you have sufficient, that's rich. I have unfortunately lived in the Great Depression when many of us did not have what we needed to be sufficient. And that makes you all the more appreciate sufficient. That, that is rich. Why? Because it's the blessings of God. So here you have the law of the church. Don't miss the next lecture. It's the promise of the coming of Christ. Don't miss it. 